The number of coronavirus cases has sharply risen. Worldwide, we've now passed two million deaths due to this pandemic. And you can see that even early on, we had explosive growth in the project that uh, quickly exceeded over a million new devices being added to the building computational side. You know, we we learned we can do things with folding at home that we couldn't before, um, and this idea of prioritizing which compounds. I'm John Cadera. I'm an uh, associate professor at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. You may re recognize me from a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'm super lucky to have with me, uh, as Sukrit mentioned, um, two fantastic scientists from the United Kingdom who stayed up late uh, to join us and, and uh, answer some of your questions tonight about uh, the COVID moonshot and what we're doing here. So uh, let me introduce both of them and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves a little bit. Frank von Delft is the head of the Diamond XChem facility, which is this fantastic experimental facility that's really accelerating drug discovery. Frank, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I um, run this uh, beam line at this uh, thing's called synchrotrons. I'm also a professor for uh, structural chemical biology at an Oxford University. And um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll very happy to, to be on, online here um, and, and talk to this community, which is doing am equally amazing things. Thanks. Uh, and we also have Alpha Lee, who's a group leader at Cambridge uh, in the UK and also a founder of a fantastic AI startup called PostEra. Alpha, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, all. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, great to be here virtually. Um, I'm Alpha, a group leader in the University of Cambridge. My, we work on machine learning for drug design and recently I spun up a company, PostEra, uh, doing uh, AI for drug discovery. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. And uh, before before we you know dive right into the details of the COVID moonshot, I, I want to encourage everyone to stick around as much as they can because we have some fun announcements and and uh, and uh, uh, maybe some some giveaways to be done after we discuss the moonshot. So stick around and you know learn something and you might get something out of it. So uh, with that, uh, I'll let you guys start chatting about the moonshot. So uh, Alpha and Frank are both founders of the COVID moonshot effort, and uh, we're super lucky to have them help walk us through some of the early stages of how it came about uh, to give you some background. So Frank is going to kick us off. Yeah, um, we call it the moonshot because it felt ridiculous at the time. Um, but yeah, you've heard about COVID-19, so we don't have to dwell on this pretty picture, pretty as it is. Um, and just uh, Max mentioned earlier the, the, the life cycle of, of um, <clears throat> the virus. So, and this protease just a few minutes ago, it is quite critical to, to how the, the virus gets around. Um, or, as it gets in, the interesting thing about viruses, they, they stop being viruses the moment they enter the cell. They just become a bunch of information that's floating around. And <clears throat> that information has to be converted into new viruses. And so, um, as you can see on the right there, I don't think I can have the mouse. But on the right, you can see the as the virus enters, its um, RNA gets transcribed into these polyproteins, which are very long strings of multiple proteins, and they have to be chopped up if they're going to do the work in the um, of convincing the cell to make more more um, virus. And this chopping up is um, so so protease is a, a general class of proteins that will cut other proteins or things that look like proteins. Um, so amino acid chains. <clears throat> so there are two proteases that, that get transcribed. And the, in this long string of, of, um, of proteins, two of them are active. And the first one that does the, um, uh, the, the cleavage, so sorry, the second one that does the cleavage is, is the, the main protease. There's the first one that, has, that, uh, that releases the main protease. And then the second one chops itself out and, and cuts up the rest. So because it's quite early in the life cycle, um, it, it is worth targeting and um, in other viruses or other viral treatments that have been transformative, HIV and HCV in particular, those um, drugs um, go after those proteases. So viruses tend to have one because they all come as sort of uh, encoded information that has to um, chop itself up. So there's typically a protease floating around and um, to, uh, and it's been known for a long time that one can productively target them. So um, this this virus, um, this protease is, is well conserved um, in, in the coronaviruses. And um, 
So what happened, the structure had been solved way back um, for, for SARS already in, in, the, in the early tweens. So when this virus was identified, the Chinese groups moved very fast, identified the, um, from the genome, they identified the, the, the protease and solved the structure very quickly and put this out into the public domain. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the coordinates were actually available uh, late January on a public web server. And they reached out to my colleague, Martin Walsh at Diamond, to say if we could help because their synchrotron facility, which they used to solve the structures in Shanghai was going in, into a shutdown. Um, and so they asked if, if we could, could help. Um, but what you can see here in front of you is um, the, on, on the right-hand panel is the, the, uh, one of the known inhibitors that had been studied and generated way back um, down to this protein that they solved. And it fits into the binding site the way we'd expect because the structure was available before from, um, from previous studies. And it opened up very nicely. And so everybody had a good sense of this target being probably possibly a viable drug target. <clears throat> so um, now the interesting thing about that work, which has been commented on quite a lot, is that while well, it was around before the, this, this kind of virus, and people did actually invest a lot of tr uh, effort um, into seeing if it could be combated. I certainly was, at the time I was in, in San Diego when SARS came by, and there was a big mobilization of, of molecular biology and structural biology to try and analyze this new virus and, and do lots of uh, structural genomics, what they call it, um, to see what, what can happen. Um, and, and also, there were definitely drug discovery efforts at the time. And sorry, can you just pop up the, push the button? Um, yeah, so, um, I think we, uh, yeah, so so the, um, there were a lot of developments in the inhibitors. Um, none of them made it close to being a drug, um, but there is this thing, um, there's a feline coronavirus, which is actually rather nasty for the cats. And um, there is a successful drug for, for cats, which is floating around. But the ones that have been developed against the human ones hadn't progressed. And there's a, a number of good reasons. One of them is economic because the virus went away. Um, so it wasn't possible to, to get them close to the clinic. But the other one is that the compounds they developed at the time aren't actually that good as drugs. They kind of look like peptides. They, they call them peptidomimetics. Um, so they weren't really um, breaking new ground. And it turns out to put peptides into a, a bloodstream and get it to, um, to, to where the virus is is quite hard for various reasons. It's got to do technical things about the... the um, this, uh, the hydrogen bonds, et cetera, that, that make them very um, uh, susceptible to be cl being cleared from the organism. Um, so those things which, which were known and published in quite a lot of work, um, they hadn't progressed. So, um, the, but, but what you, if you look at them carefully, um, then there are a lot of motifs on those, um, on those pteromimetics, which um, can be exploited and, um, or which, which, which could be drug-like. And so the question was, could, um, could it be possible to get to a compound which would use exploit the same binding opportunities which we saw in, in, in the known inhibitors? Um, so, so they are inhibitors. They do definitely stop the protease from being act active. So they will block the enzyme. Um, but could we then come up with a new, new small molecule and do it quickly, which would be potent and actually be a drug candidate? Um, so that question was sitting around, and most people would say, no, that was ridiculous, because we know that it takes euros and euros to develop drugs, which is very much a thing out there. Um, but so when, um, when the Chinese groups approached my colleague Martin Welsh, um, we, they couldn't actually, <laughs> it was quite a, um, uh, it's, it's kind of silly, they had crystals and, uh, you know, these protein crystals too, which they might have sent over from China to the UK for us to measure. Um, but they couldn't because everything was complicated, um, good goods wise. So Martin's group just sat down and redesigned the, 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 the gene construct that gave the protease. Um, and so by middle of February, they'd done that. Um, and then just a few days later, they actually got this thing to crystallize. They purified it, got it crystallized and, um, and, and solved the structure very quickly. I remember this was a Friday and on the Monday afternoon, um, uh, or he, he caught me in the office and said, look, we've got this protein, it diffracts rather well. Do you think we should do a, a fragment screen? And um, I had group meetings straight after, and I told my group, guys, this is get, the shit's getting real, right? You know, we've got to just drop everything and do this experiment. And they all piled in. Um, at the same time, uh, we sent the protein off to, to near London at the Weizmann. He's got a, a assay for finding these, these um, uh, 
collection or uh, finding molecules that might bind through mass spectrometry assay. And um, just by at the end of the week, he'd done that experiment already. Mm -hmm. And in parallel, we were doing the screening experiment at Diamond. So what is this screening experiment? Um, it's called fragment fragment based approaches, where you take molecules that um, that are not, they're, they're molecules in their own right, but they look like they're fragments of a bigger drug molecule. And um, what's not effective about them is that they tend to um, you tend to find them bound to the surface of the molecule and in particular the, the active site so the, the bit where the enzyme does its work um, and there's many ways of finding these molecules but the, the facility the XCAM facility we, we developed at diamond does this gold standard experiment where you're not only identifying whether a particular molecule binds but you can immediately see it um, bound in the 3d structure and this is experimental and the big deal about it is it's very hard to do if you aren't set up for it, but we managed to streamline it a few years ago so that you could test hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of compounds within a week. Um, so, and then you see collections of them. But when this thing came by, we said we will do as big a screen as we can possibly do, which ended up being about 1,200 um, fragment compounds. And um, we'd rarely done that before, and usually it would be over months. And we squeeze this into a week and a half experimental time which was yeah. just before we had this so, so it's worth yeah. noting that the diamond light source is like this you know it's an x-ray crystallography facility right and and it's using these x-rays to determine the protein structures is, is yeah it's, it's a very good point sorry i i skipped through this with my my daily bread and they forget it's <laughs> yeah no it's and it's, a, it's actually thing. it's a really standard uh kind of structural biological methodology right it's it's a a very normal, you know, normal way now to, to determine these kinds of structures and get these atomic resolution pictures. Yeah, correct. So X-ray structure, X-ray crystallography has been going for a long time. Um, what a place like Diamond is, and it's one of these things called synchrotrons. There's a number of them dotted around the world, which is a facility dedicated entirely to providing X-rays to users. So it's it's completely outward looking, but it's a huge thing. This uh, Diamond is one of the smaller ones. Um, and that is itself half a kilometer in circumference. Um, and around it, you've got, it generates x-rays for all kinds of experiments, but certainly um, for x-ray crystallography. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's, um, it, it's, a, it's, an it's a great place to work. It's like geek heaven because you've got engineers and programmers and scientists and everything working together as this massive corporate team to just achieve complete delivery of x-ray beam to users. And so usually we've got users coming in the door all the time and we still had that going on when we did this experiment, but we kind of squeezed in these these uh, 1,500 crystals, um, uh, of which some were redundant. And um, so we managed to put that experiment together. And of course, a bit later we locked down in the UK. Yeah. But um, yeah. So so what you can see on the right there is is the sort of um, atomic snapshot of, of the things binding. Did you have a question? So good. Right, yeah, so here's a little video about how it looks. Um, so we grow these crystals, um, that's the schematic of them in these micro tighter plates. And you have, usually you're, you're like, happy to find one or two, but before we do the experiment, we need to have loads of crystals in all these drops. And then we have got, using acoustic dispensing, we can dispense the compounds, those colored things, straight into the drops. And so now you're mixing individual compounds with individual crystals. It's a pro protocol we'd worked out a while ago using just really fantastic um, liquid dispensing um, um, robots. And, uh, and then you incubate this for, for a bit, uh, not very long, a few hours if you want to. And then so each of these crystals is now mixed with a different compound. And then you've got to go about setting, picking up each of these crystals into a little um, loop, as you can see there, and it gets frozen at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And then when you do the experiment, you illuminate that um, crystal with, um, with x-rays and, and this gives a diffraction pattern, which is simulated by the blue the blue beams. And so you get a whole collection for each crystal, a collection of diffraction patterns, and a whole lot of maths and computation later will convert that diffraction pattern into this atomic structure. Um, it's very technical, very involved, and a lot of fun if you like that sort of thing, which I do. Um, and so you get the atomic positions, and um, in this case, we did that measurement hundreds and hundreds of times, in fact, 1,500 times by the end of it. And some fraction of those compounds ended up down to the binding site. And you can see that the overview, that's the surface of the protein, that gray blob, um, and the colored sticks are the various compounds that were bound. And they're all essentially starting points for what we might then develop into compounds. And the notable thing in this picture is that the active site, which is those little four colored squares there, 
is very well covered. So we had things binding in all parts of the active site. And as John will say a lot more about that, but clearly one thing you could see immediately, and it was a result of having this very large number of compounds that you can look at two of them and see, hey, hang on, these things could probably be put together into a single compound and they could be synthesized. And there's a good chance if both of them bound individually that if you stick them together as one compound, they will bound a lot better. And we, I call this the merge space. So we had a lot of potential mergers lurking in this in this whole um, experiment. And that's what, what then got us quite excited. And um, we started talking. Um, <clears throat> so I think the next slide is where we hand over to Alpha. Yeah. Uh, we started talking about what one might do with this experiment, which we'd managed to achieve. And now COVID was all across the world. <laughs> Things were getting real. Yes. So, so we, uh, uh, yes. we, we, we spotted these. Uh, amazing results by Frank and his team. And we thought, well, it would be great if these fragments, these beautiful results can be turned into a drug. But obviously drug discovery is a extremely long and expensive process. Even in the, this diagram illustrates how tedious is the process, target identification. You need to first know which protein you're looking after and then finding a compound to hit it. And then, you know, optimizing that compound, developing into preclinical studies and then three phase of clinical trial. That will be a decade with at least five years spent on just the chemical matter itself. And five years is exactly what we do not have for coronavirus. <laughs> we want it to be as fast as possible. So we thought, well, what is the fastest way we can develop this given that we have the new technology pioneered by Frank and others? Um, what, what is the, another force multiplier that we can leverage? And the force multiplier we thought is to do it together, do it openly. And that's the philosophy of COVID Moonshot and complete open science patent-free drug discovery project. This is, I think, one of the only uh, attempts at, the, at this effort in the COVID space. What this means is that um, we share we complete open science. We share all our learnings, all our findings with the community, and we solicit community feedback in driving the project. So it's not only us, uh, but we are leaning on, onto a whole community of uh, medicinal chemists, and also you guys are kindly contributing your GPU and CPU compute hours to help us in this pursuit. All data is published immediately uh, for the whole community to consume and to feedback ideas. And importantly, because everything is open, there is no patents. And that's really important because patents are legal protections or legal warrants that stops other people from working in the same area and ultimately stops people from manufacturing the eventual drugs. We have none of that. Everything is open. So if you find something, anyone around the world can manufacture it. Um, and that we think in, improves access and means that knowledge can be disseminated and the drug would not only be effective, but also equitable. So what are we actually aiming for? We're aiming for, if you may, an aspirin for COVID, a pill orally ingestible that can treat COVID and prevent infection in high risk individuals. It will be a pill that is cheap like aspirin with minimal side effects. Um, you may say, well, COVID, might be blowing over, so why should we care? Well, it's not only COVID, but it's also effective against future coronaviruses because as Frank mentioned beginning, the main protease, the target we are hitting, the protein we're hitting is actually broadly conserved across different strains of coronaviruses. And I think the recurring theme in, in this session is that you know, COVID-19 is one member of this uh, family of viruses, which, which is around and will be around for, for a while. And importantly, um, because it is a drug, it means that there's no cold chain um, involved, unlike vaccines, which need to be stored at low temperature and very easy uh, distribution. But also one cannot underestimate the, I guess, the sociological aspect of this as well. I think there has been, uh, for, for perhaps wrong reasons, a social taboo around vaccine, also the practical implication that you have to uh, vaccinate a lot of people, even healthy ones, uh, and especially healthy ones, to get any sense of herd immunity. But with a drug, you only take it if you are ill and when you're ill and when you think that you might be at risk of infection. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a therapeutic strategy uh, that is a lot more palatable and a lot more scalable across the world. Alpha, it's probably also yeah. important to say something like, you know, we're not quite sure whether or not um, uh, it's going to be like polio where one vaccine can completely eradicate the virus or much probably much more likely like influenza where you have tetravalent vaccines against multiple strains and even then it has to it doesn't provide complete protection for the population uh, through vaccines and you still have to change it and get vaccinated every year exactly um, yeah 
so so yeah it, it's it's worth noting that you kind of want you, you know with with the public health threat that COVID is and a few people have brought this up in the chat is uh, is you know we want to explore every avenue possible, right? We we want both the vaccine options and those that may arise, as well as uh, as well as the 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 pills. In fact, uh, Tofu Hunden asked how have how have the recent vaccine press releases uh, affected your you know vision of the of the landscape? You know, has it changed much, or are you still just pushing? Uh, forward? I, We're pushing I, I, as hard as we can. I think I think uh, obviously we are very happy that there are other. Um, successes in this field. I think the world needs more than one shot on goal. But I think what we are, when we started, we know that vaccines uh, is one would be one strategy. And we think we are even more emboldened that you know the world has more than one solution for COVID. And I think ultimately what we are fighting is um, future coronaviruses, uh, as well as a scalable uh, therapeutic strategy intervention that can roll, uh, roll out across the world. So I think we are- very and that, Yeah, I think we need, we need last lines of defense as well. And, and you know, the way these things play, play out, you can't really predict it. So it's, it's fantastic that there's good news on the va vaccines. Um, but biology is a weird thing and it's unpredictable. And, you know, there's, look at any disease, look at it's, it's the way the, um, the pharmaceutical interventions have been planned or everything. They fail at some point, they go wrong, you know, things happen and, and we can't stop. You know, we have to keep going, everybody like the clappers until the pandemic is gone. We really can't stop, and if it's it has to be gone everywhere. And so the bottom one is an important one. You know, it's one thing for an advanced economy to decide to vaccine its population. It's a very different one for you know populations that are elsewhere um, where, where they they aren't as advanced. And pills are rem remarkable things. You know, you can put them in a bottle, and <laughs> if you've had pneumonia or something, and you've got a shot of antibiotics, and the pneumonia vanished. I had this I, I, as a subsequent of having some COVID in may it's it's miraculous how the disease just vanishes and you forget this 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 miracle of, of a drug um and it does feel like we need that in the in the cupboard as well and even if not for this pandemic for the next one um, we can't be in a situation again where we've invested collectively as society so much and then it goes away and we just as vulnerable as before we can't have this yeah so we have to keep going um, I would sort of make one more point to Alpha. Sorry, um, I, I skipped over it, but the reason Alpha knew about this is because we knew we can do this experiment to generate the data and then do nothing. Uh, and then we, we can't move it further. So we sent out a tweet um, to say, this data is out there. And so lots of people saw it, <laughs> including Alpha, and they got in, in touch and the rest then just followed. So it was actually an interesting social experiment of how do you get your data out? Do you publish it? Do you put it in the existing databases? What do you do? Well, let's try social media. And, oh, look what happened. So <laughs> yeah, I think it does the power of Social media is indeed uh, is indeed very 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 powerful, um, and as Frank alluded to, like to I mean the first thing you do to engage um, the the community is to obviously set up a website, uh, which we did, and uh, the idea is uh, Frank I mean and his group uh, um, obtain a lot of data of these fragments. These are small bits of the molecule, as Frank alluded to, that can bind to the main uh, protease, but you know that, those are small pieces of a jigsaw. You need to stitch those pieces of jigsaw together form a full-fledged uh, molecular weapon that can stop the protein from working. And we thought about what's the fastest way of getting that, Well, the fastest way to stitch these together is to ask medicinal chemists around the world and citizen scientists, what can they do if, once they see all these beautiful fragments, what ideas do they have in how to stitch them together? So we set up a website and we ask people, design a compound based on that and submit it to our website. And Nia tweeted this out. Um, uh, on, on Twitter, a uh, uh, very, very effective uh, venue. And, you know, we thought we may get maybe a few people um, geeky enough to uh, respond, but uh, we, 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 we were overwhelmed and very humbled by the support we have had from the community and there's multiple tweets uh, uh, be, being fired and people are tweeting about it and designing compounds uh, for us uh, and, you know, Within two weeks, we thought we might get, you know, maybe a hundred compounds from a few friends and colleagues. But at the end, we got within two weeks over two thousand compounds. And uh, when this, when 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 we checked a, a few months a month ago, it was already at seven thousand designs. And yesterday, I checked again; it's the number went up 
again, drastically to now over 10,000. So I think we are seeing a lot of community response, people just designing compounds based on the crystal structures that uh, Frank and coworkers released. And we, we adopted the approach where we look at all the crowdsourced compounds and we decide, well, we need to first make compounds that are you know, easy to make. Um, and, and of course, um, just a map showing uh, the community that COVID moonshot has become uh, all around the world, uh, Oxford, uh, uh, MSKCC in, 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 in US, um, uh, Cambridge in, in the UK and you know, all around the world, even with folks like Sci Life Sciences contributing uh, free synthetic chemistry resources. So helping us to make the compound physically and enemine in Ukraine uh, contributing a lot of um, uh, in-kind support. Um, UCB Pharma in Belgium giving us um, a lot of advice and MedChem Design uh, and many, many others. Uh, and also you guys are voting at home, uh, kindly giving us compute resources. And now we are overwhelmed with a lot of ideas, you know, really, really humbled by the support we've got. The next question is, well, as I alluded to, we need to kind of make these compounds in the lab before we can test it. And that's where a key piece of uh, my research and my and, um, the algorithm we work on become, becomes uh, important. We basically develop a recipe generating engine that can quickly design ways to make organic compounds. And um, it may not be well known that you, for, um, even with a structure that you want to make, so for example, the structure on the left was submitted by a member of the community, actually realizing this structure and making this chemical compound in the lab can be involved process much like cooking. And the state of the art would be um, coming up with these recipes by hand and trying out in the lab but we develop a machine learning engine that can quickly uh, come up with these recipes about how to make compounds. So we can go through thousands and thousands of compounds in less than a weekend, which will take a normal chemist weeks. And the underpinning technology is a technology inspired by machine translation, which basically entails learning the rules of chemistry from scratch by training on thousands and thousands of tens of millions of published uh, chemical reactions and our academic papers uh, will was the first model to actually outperform trained human chemists in predicting chemical reactivity and patterns of uh, chemical reaction. So we use this technology, apply it at scale to decide which compounds can be made quickly and how can we quickly accelerate the compound making process. And by focusing on ease, synthetically tractable chemistry, we're able to iterate a lot quicker, get a lot more compounds tested and ultimately arrive at a much faster uh, cycle of iterative improvement in and getting better, better compounds. And talking about speed, um, one, one, one of another enabling piece of technology that COVID Moonshot relies on is the high throughput screening uh, facilities and the uh, screening automated screening facilities that we have set up at the Weizmann Institute uh, with Professor Neil London, but also at Oxford with Chris Schoenfield using complementary techniques to quickly screen compounds for main protease uh, activity. Uh, quickly testing which compounds can successfully block the main protease from functioning. So you may ask, well, we have all these crowdsourcing, machine learning to decide recipes to make them and robots to screen these compounds. Well, what results have we got? Well, this is a series of compounds that we have prioritized in crowdsourcing. Um, the, the top three pictures show um, so crystal, crystallographic or three-dimensional experimental images that Frank acquired of different small pieces of molecule binding and a member of the uh, of our community uh, thought, well, we can actually merge these fragments together, stitch them together, and lo and behold, we get our first um, hit with 23 micromolar, which is a, a pretty good starting point. Um, and, and this this fellow, Trifon, uh, is actually from Oxford, submitting designs inspired by the fragments. Obviously, we went beyond uh, the community immediately saw this result and was really excited about it. And we quickly designed follow-up compounds that mm -hmm. gone beyond the original design. The community it's, uh, submitted that now this is six fold, 32 fold and 7.5 fold better than the first iterate, the first generation. And then once those results came in, the community again got really excited and say, well, why not merge the second, merge those results and get an even stronger compound. And lo and behold, we got uh, 0. 260 nanomolar yeah. and 27 nanomoles. That's like almost a uh, hundred fold better than the original submission just by um, rapidly releasing these structures and leveraging community support in helping us 
guide us where to go next? Yeah, so so for you know the the, the merging of these optimizations are phenomenal. Uh, but for, you know, just for a sense of scale, then so you know, going from ten micromolar scales to the nanomolar scale is actually an incredible leap. I mean, you're yep. you've now entered the like lead compound phase right. of a drug discovery project. Is that is that a correct? Yep, exactly. We are now in uh, lead optimization, uh, very deep into that. And we are very confident that we would have a traditional candidate available uh, very soon. Um, I think that that rapid advance, because we are leaning on not only knowledge of the small team, but also knowledge of the entire community. And that has been the premise of the project. I think that is borne out really well in all these data. Just, just yeah. to set the scale here, the IC50 number tells you what concentration you need yeah. to achieve of the drug in order to shut down 50% of the, the enzyme. And so uh, the smaller the number gets, the smaller the pill you need is. And unfortunately, you start in a place where you need to swallow a kilogram pill in order to <laughs> get this to work, and that's not going to work. Um, yeah. so there'd be other problems as well. So now you're getting down to the point where you can deliver somebody something that's much less than a gram uh, and have it be very effective. Indeed. Yeah, and you you called it like a like a preclinical candidate. So you know what what uh, what what is the next step for a process that was that would be considered preclinical candidate? So I think we are now showing, for example, that it's active against a virus. So here, this uh, we show that one of the our lead compound is uh, strongly active against uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is a live virus assay. So we show that the compound kills the virus um, in in the petri dish without killing human cells. Um, so uh, at least in this uh, petri dish level, it's not toxic and is effective against the virus. And two micromolar here means that two micromolar of the compound, a very low concentration, is sufficient to kill the virus but not kill human cells. And the next That's step awesome. is to make sure that the compound is actually stable in the human body uh, and 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 you know soluble, stable, um, and understanding further characterizing toxicity and further improving potency. Um, and and. We realize that actually in constructing these synthetic recipes that there are a lot of scope in expanding the compound and that uh, leads to a lot of different, a large library of compounds that one can think about making and that then falls into John's hands in helping us decide how and how to, how, how to prioritize compounds. Yeah, go ahead. Folding at home has been uh, is essential on multiple different levels, not only at the early stages of filtering compounds uh, that we actually prioritize for synthesis, but at the later stages of trying to identify which of these analogs we can make quickly. And these are really interesting uh, uh, operations where the med chemists come up with a route where they can make a bunch of different compounds, many thousands sometimes from that, in that final step by just changing out different ingredients from the catalog that enamine has on hand. Uh, and they can make them very rapidly because they work from a single intermediate and do a bunch of reactions, single reactions in parallel, and then work them up in parallel and ship them off. So the question is, which ones should the chemists make as we're pursuing these final steps in potency and trying to get rid of other issues like solubility problems that um, uh, are plaguing or plague the, the end states of every drug discovery project. So in, for, for the sprints uh, that you've been running uh, on your GPUs recently, we've been using a tool called alchemical free energy calculations. And I know it's a really weird term because uh, it, it says uh, we're transmuting something into something else. In this case, instead of lead into gold, which is a process that can't happen into chemistry, we're changing one molecule into another molecule, uh, which also can't happen into, in chemistry, but it can happen in a computer. So we're simulating these weird non-chemical processes where we turn one molecule into another molecule. Here, here's a little bit about how this works, uh, for example. Um, we, we start with one of these uh, fragment structures or a reference structure from our current lead compound from uh, Frank von Delft's group. Uh, and then we enumerate a bunch of different uh, designs of how this new molecule, which shares part of the old molecule, uh, might actually look if it's posed in the binding site. We pick one of those that looks like it's a reasonable interaction. And then we use these non-equilibrium free energy calculations um, that a student in my lab, Dominic Rufa and Hannah Bruce McDonald, who's now at, um, at uh, uh, Merck Co, uh, Research Co in uh, the UK, um, set up for us. Uh, and this uses uh, non-equilibrium switching and some cool non-equilibrium stat mech that I don't have time to go into uh, to compute the relative free energies between the two different old and new ligands in the bonding site and in the solvent. And from that, we can work backwards and see how well it recapitulates what we know the, the affinities are for a known series of molecules. And we can work forwards too to see um, 
uh, which molecules are going to bind more potently than our current designs. And I should say that all of the software we're using here is open source and online. It's not super easy to use yet because it's still a research tool, but it's it's uh, all open source software, and we believe firmly in in helping other people. Um, uh, so we make all of our tools open. Yeah, just to, just to clarify, uh, really briefly, John, uh, when you say like the free energy, these relative free energies, you're basically uh, doing a comparison of how well these compounds bind in the, That's in the right. pocket, right? So and, we're, the free energies are related to these affinities and the IC50s that we showed you. So a free energy difference of one, um, uh, of, uh, one kcal per mole or 1.2 kcal per mole, for example, means that it binds um, uh, a great deal better. So we're looking for, for things that have one or two or three kilocalories per mole better in free energy. And that means that they're gonna bind significantly better um, more tightly and those IC50 numbers are gonna go down, meaning you need less of the pill um, in order to uh, treat the disease. And that simplifies lots of things that you would otherwise run into with trying to put a lot of some exogenous molecule into humans. John, could you just clarify, to get this energy, you have to do a bunch of simulation, right? And then yeah. from that you derive the energy, is that correct? So the, the way this works is that you actually go through this non-equilibrium cycle where you simulate molecule A, the initial molecule for about half a nanosecond, and then you actually change, transmute uh, alchemically uh, molecule A into molecule B over another half of a nanosecond. So you're actually turning off the interactions that have to do with the old substituent, and then you turn on the interactions with the rest of the world that have to do with the new side chain uh, substituent that you're putting in, uh, turning on in the molecule. And so you you figure out how much work it takes to push you from A to B. And then you sit in B for a little while and go backwards and come from B to A. So each of these cycles you're running is about two nanoseconds. And then um, we take all the data from many of these cycles, hundreds of them per molecule, um, and integrate that using some clever statistical mechanics that a fellow named Gavin Crooks discovered, um, uh, that you could relate these non-equilibrium measurements of work to equilibrium free energy differences, which actually have a practical input or impact in drug discovery here. Um, and turn these into binding affinities that the chemists can use to make decisions about which compounds are most important to synthesize right now. Yeah, so just, to, and also the, the one to two nanosecond simulations, the non-equilibrium simulations you're talking about, those are the, the sprints, right? Yes, so each sprint is composed of many hundreds of, uh, or to thousands of uh, transformations where the latest sprint five has 15,000 transformations in it that we're plowing through very rapidly. And each transformation has um, each run on folding at home has uh, hundreds to thousands of these these little switches back and forth on them. Um, and then all of that data goes in together. So it, it's a, a very, very large data set uh, to analyze and, and, and do that in real time. And so we track our progress uh, thanks to the, uh, this wonderful new uh, progress bar uh, that Anton set up on our homepage. Um, the progress bar is also mirrored on the, the COVID moonshot page, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. Um, and you know, it, it shows us how many of the molecules we've, parameter, or we've uh, prioritized uh, and evaluated at once. Um, and just to give you some scale here, you know, the, uh, one of the earlier sprints chewed through 2.3 million work units just to uh, get affinities uh, for a bunch of different molecular designs. That's, that's 10 milliseconds of simulation time, which is an enormous amount of computation time when you think about it. It's almost something that you can see uh, you know, in, in, in macroscopic reality. And and what these, mm -hmm. I was gonna say, so, and it's worth noting that like, you know, these simulations aren't just the same type of uh, equilibrium simulations we ran when we were hunting for, for cryptic pockets, but rather these are slightly made perhaps more computationally intensive. And so even collecting, you know, normally we would collect nanoseconds and, and so collecting 10 milliseconds is again, a new whole new scale of these kinds of, this kind of data set. Absolutely, yeah, this is, there's a lot of interesting things that we're gonna learn from reanalyzing this data. It's all going on the AWS Public Datasets program. Uh, we're in the middle process of organizing it and putting it up right now, but we're already working with other researchers who are mining this data for uh, other insights about how to do these kinds of calculations more efficiently. So I think it'll lead to a lot of discoveries and improvements in our, in our technology. Each sprint certainly we've learned from both how to make it more robust and how to make it more efficient. Um, so Sprint 1, for example, focused on this, uh, this one idea of, you know, they, they found a substituent, uh, the, the chemists who submitted crowdsource designs, uh, that made things seven times better, but unfortunately added a group that we can't have on a real drug. This beta-lactam group has a lot of liabilities. Um, and instead, the chemists tasked us with this idea of, 
here's a bunch of things we could make using a couple of robust reactions. Are any of them nearly as good? And so after scoring all of these uh, molecular designs that popped out from the top, um, a few of them, at least, or three of them in this case, uh, came up with designs that were almost as good, not quite, maybe uh, only three and a half times better instead of seven times better. However, some of those compounds that are the winners have uh, are pretty lipophilic. So that means that they don't like water as much as they like being buried in your lipid membranes. And that's going to cause some problems. So we're still trying to find other substituents that reach down into this P4 pocket at the bottom there. Um, you can see the winners uh, modeled in uh, from here. But we did learn a lot about how, how this process works. Um, what's amazing is that there's a lot of bad ideas out there. So if you just look through what you can make, most of the ideas are, are bad in that they increase your affinity or increase your free energy and make the compound less potent. That's to the right. Uh, and only a few designs at this tail on the left are actually better. We also scored a bunch of designs that the chemists, uh, the chemists from real uh, medicinal chemistry programs um, in pharma uh, came up with. And it turns out they are significantly better at coming up with really good molecules. Their distributions are shifted way to the left. But uh, the surprising thing is, is that, you know, you can only ask them to uh, give you a couple dozen ideas, uh, mm -hmm. whereas you can have the computers come up with many more ideas. So even though the humans are better, uh, sometimes the computers win simply because they can come up with and score more ideas more quickly. Yeah, this is actually related to a, a question you have in our chat from Dan sure. British, who asks, uh, when deciding a work unit to assign for a theoretical compound that hasn't been synthesized yet, are there specific measurements which are taken from previous sprints to decide a future possible match? So, so what other, are there other parameters that are incorporated besides just the alchemical free energy calculation? It's a great question. We're, we're working on machine learning algorithms now that extract information and insight from the previous transformations to learn which transformations are easier and which transformations are harder. And that's gonna go into future sprints to adaptively allocate how many work units we need to actually carry out a transformation to, to a certain statistical reliability. So both uh, learning from previous sprints and then adaptively allocating effort to, um, you know, once you know it's a bad design, you don't need to spend more time on it. So we're working on the infrastructure to be able to support that. It hasn't been possible in the previous sprints, but uh, rest assured we are learning from those, um, uh, both using the data and, and coming up with more robust ways to do these calculations. I think, John, it's also worth mentioning what the, the thing that, that you said was seemed to work quite well is to incorporate experimental data because the compounds that have been synthesized, we try and put them into crystals and a, quite a lot of them actually show up in the crystal structures again. So this is a pile of experimental data, which is also public available for whoever wants to use it, including John. And that um, seems to be reflective, if I understood correctly, of, um, of, uh, of how things are working in the simulations. And presumably, they can um, coexist or um, they, they can complement one another with this prioritization. Absolutely. Everything here is based upon rapid cycles and uh, where we go back and forth between computational designs, we put those into the synthesis queue. And as soon as the new data comes in from affinities and structures, that informs the next rounds of computation and which questions the chemists ask us to address. So we're always using the newest structures that come from uh, Frank's uh, diamond light source. Um, it's really amazing to be in a position where we have so much structural data coming in at the same time as the affinity data. I've never seen a project that had such an abundance of rapidly collected structural data, which means that we can really leverage it to come up with uh, better designs here. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been a fantastic iterative uh, uh, virtuous cycle and hopefully one that will continue for future projects as well. Um, just to quickly go through sprints two, three, and four, because I want to get to sprint five. Um, sprint two uh, looked at also other chemistries that could allow us to find other ideas for this uh, P4 pocket. We got a lot of ideas that are, are more difficult to synthesize and are, are still in the synthesis queue right now. Three and four focused on different uh, scaffolds. So these are different lead series that are, are competing with the ones you just saw, because we never know which one is going to pan out and become the most potent. For a while, uh, the, pen, it was, the benzotriazoles looked really exciting, but then the Ugis uh, on the right uh, pulled ahead. These are really interesting multi-component one pot in, uh, reactions that are really easy to do in parallel. And so are very exciting, but we also uh, have found recently that they run into uh, other metabolic liabilities where compounds like the one on the right can be chewed up by your liver enzymes very quickly. So we're trying to find ways around that. This is always a, a game of uh, balancing multiple different series at the same time because you never know which one is going to win out in the end. So you need to have multiple backup plans at any given time. Uh, so Sprint 5, the one that's running right now on your on your GPUs, um, is looking at building on what 
what was started in the sprints one and two, but reaching up to a different pocket, the P1 prime pocket uh, up above. And this takes the evolution of this series, which has become uh, the chemistry name is a benzopurin on the left and an isoquinoline on the right in the leftmost diagram, um, and uh, build, tries to build on it using these clever synthetic routes that the chemists have identified, but they're multi-step routes and they involve making a lot of a certain kind of intermediate from which you can jump off and make another uh, bunch of different downstream products. And overall we can make 15,000, but we don't wanna have to make all of the intermediates because that would take a long time and be very expensive. So we're using the sprint right now, which is cycling through a bunch of molecules like you see on the right to decide which intermediates we should make a lot of. Uh, and some of that has already been read out and is in progress. And then which compounds specifically we're supposed to make from each one of those intermediates. Um, we've got this science dashboard preview, which I'll tweet out next. I've still been tinkering with it, which is why I hadn't released it mainly, but it shows us which compounds are on the leaderboard, which microstates, uh, which are this, this different chiral versions of those compounds uh, are in the lead and which transformations we've computed, how reliable we think they are. So uh, back to Alpha for telling us about where the moonshot is going. Yes, so uh, I think we have, as John and Frank alluded to, um, we, we have made a lot of very exciting progress. I think roughly, roughly we think about the Moonshot Drug Discovery Initiative as comprising three stages. The first is crowdsource compounds that can kill the virus in cells. And I think we have crossed this milestone uh, with flying colors, thanks to all of your support. And now we are at this very critical and very exciting stage two, which is to actually do animal trials, to test the drug, uh, the candidate compounds in animal models, and we are now fundraising one and a half million uh, for animal testing. I think uh, we have launched a campaign, HelpCureCovid.org, uh, and we would uh, be really grateful for your donations and contribution to this effort. I think this is a completely community-driven uh, effort uh, to fund a drug discovery campaign, which would seed the uh, grounds for pan future pandemic preparedness. So I think we, we would deeply appreciate uh, your help in this regard. And then obviously after testing that the drug is efficacious in animals and in that we mean we can cure an animal uh, with COVID and, and um, successfully the next stage will be testing in the humans and producing it in mass, on mass and distributing it and we are confident that we'll be able to achieve that uh, towards human in the next, next year. And I think these are um, really uh, rapid progress in, in drug discovery and I think um, we, would, we are leaning on the community uh, for for support in helping us move this campaign forward. Yeah, and so so I mean, this was actually a question that was asked a while back, but it feels I mean, it's especially relevant right now. Uh, Anand Hutt asked, uh, you know, what what partnerships are you looking for, perhaps with philanthropic organizations or trusts such as the Gates Foundation or others? Like, what what avenues of funding are you already looking at, and you know, what can the community do? Not just from donating money, but helping amplify the voice of the moonshot and folding it home to work. I think any uh, sharing of our efforts and our results in uh, social media would be greatly appreciated. I think um, getting the, the word out to the world as loudly as possible, uh, making the case for uh, drug discovery as a pandemic preparedness strategy. I think in terms of the specific question with philanthropic uh, funds uh, or, or foundations, we have got two letters of support from two of the world's uh, largest medical charities um, with experience in bringing drugs to market, uh, basically agreeing in principle to uh, help us bring this drug to market if we were to complete stage two. So stage two is a critical step. Stage three, we have got uh, support letters of intent already. Uh, and these organizations are chipping in, uh, funding themselves to some extent to help us in-kind donation and, and in one case actually funding uh, to seed this effort as well. So I think uh, it is about sort of leveraging crowd support and spreading the word and making sure that the, the this is uh, known around the world. Yeah. Yeah, and and kind of circling back to you know what you're trying to do now with the animal testing, which is I mean to get to get to this point normally takes years for an academic effort. So to to get here within a in a month's time for an scale, industry we, effort, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know anyone. Uh, I I don't claim to know industry efforts. That's I, that's where I was coming from here. But uh, but someone did ask, and I think it's relevant to the the news that kind of has been floating around uh, some mainstream news sources, which is. Uh, you know, what will the animal testing include? Will the animal testing include potential sources of mutations, such as the minks and bats that are kind of circulating in the news right now? Absolutely. I think what the animal testing itself would be with 
the prevalent strain of COVID, but we are really much um, with, um, have in mind the problem of mutation. And one of the viral testing that we would do in the Petri dish is to uh, basically serially passage. So you test, you, in, you, you treat the cell and then isolate viruses that are still alive, amplify the virus, treat it again and again and again to see uh, to what extent can the virus develop uh, resistance against the compound and to understand whether there are a series of compounds that will be less resistance prone. So I think that's absolutely one of the things that we have uh, in the back of our minds to make sure that we have developed something that will withstand viral resistance. We've been talking a lot about the animal models that will be in use too. So one of the first uh, uh, things that's happening right now is uh, whether the uh, compounds will have oral exposure in rats. So they, they end up being fed compounds and making sure that the drug will get to where it's needed to actually be able to cure COVID. Those are sort of the earliest models. And then there's, there's later stage models where you have uh, animals that get sick from the disease where you show in vivo efficacy. Um, there's a lot of different disease models that are, are still emerging right now because COVID is still so new. Um, one of them is Syrian hamsters, is, it turns out to be a very interesting model. Um, ferrets also get very sick from COVID um, and have very se severe disease. Uh, so that's another disease model. Uh, we're monitoring this essentially week by week to figure out which disease models are going to be the most appropriate to actually go through. And it should be added that that the um, infectious diseases are at some level biologically easier to target than you know your human uh, you know uh, non-transmitted diseases where the human biology has gone wrong because it's kind of easy to know whether you've hit the thing you want to hit. You don't want to look at the disease itself is complex. Like, you know, this everybody's scratching their head and not understanding what's happening. So to cure the disease is one thing, but so whenever people try and target the immune system, et cetera, those kind of treatments, there are complexities there, but the virus itself is simpler. So the animal model doesn't necessarily need to cure the disease in the animal. It just has to get rid of the virus in the animal. And then one has a lot of sure, um, reassurance about how it might um, progress in, 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 in humans. So um, that is, it's a, it's a long discussion, obviously, with, with clinicians and who, people who would have to set up the clinical trials of what is the, you know, how much do you need to have shown experimentally in advance of thinking of going to, to clinical trials. Um, but uh, our, our initial discussions indicate that um, uh, the way to think about viruses is, can you just stop the virus from replicating? Can you show that that is a, happening in an animal model the whether the disease progression mirrors what the human has or not, you know, that isn't necessarily the interesting question. Um, the, the one that matters is the mechanistic one. Um, a virus in a living organism that is replicating doesn't stop replicating, and then you have a very strong hand to, to play with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and and kind of building off of that, then uh, uh, Dan, the British in our chat asked, "What if any so far learnings have been?" have been you know, taken, lessons and, and, and stuff have been taken from the research so far, which could be applied to the future, per, either on the computational side or the experimental side. I, I can say briefly about the computational side, you know, we, we've learned we can do things with fooling at home that we couldn't before. Um, and this idea of prioritizing which compounds to purchase or synthesize through free energy calculations is really compelling. So uh, Frank's uh, Diamond X Chem, is running many of these public projects per per year. And maybe you could say more about the future uh, evolution of that, but we very much hope that Fulling at Home could be a, a primary partner in helping prioritize which compounds should be selected for purchase to follow up on any of the hits that they get in the future. And we're, we're happy to uh, lend the automation to do that. I mean, I, um, this is <laughs> this is the sort of thing we look at, oh, great. There's this huge resource living out there that that, that um, experimenters can tap into, um, you know, and and, this the streamlining that's happened. It's reflective of the overall project. The technical debt that we've been carrying all along is actually amazing. And if you compute the actual experiment and man hours that have gone into getting to this point, it, it turns out to be uh, maybe a few months and not seven, eight months, which is we've covered. So if you look forward, you can think there are clear inefficiencies in any process that can be, um, that ought to be addressable. Now, it's not. It's easier said than done because there's a reason why they exist, and of course, in many big farmers, they exist as well. But one of the major major things that have has um, struck me for a while, a while is that um, just the sort of 
uh, should I call them bureaucratic elements or legal elements have, have a big role to play in this. You know, why does it take long to get a compound from A to B? So which contracts have to be signed? Have the people agreed to do it in advance? Um, so do you first have to sign a contract? The big luxury we had here, luxury in inverted commas, is that nobody made a point of getting these things signed in advance because of the urgency of it. Everybody that pitched in said, oh, we'll just contribute anyway and, you know, send the compounds and send me the bill later, that sort of thing. Um, so it does point to where we could think about um, sort of anticipating a future pandemic that you've got maybe the collaboration pre-set up, you know, pre-configured for when it happens so that the people are sort of on call. And then when the call comes, everybody jumps in and they're kind of ready within a few weeks. And conceivably, that could be very quickly. Whether we, as a hum humankind, get our act together and set up these structures is a different question. But you know, if we manage to do it this fast, and we still have inefficiencies we can point to, which are very clearly definable, um, I think uh, uh, we, we we can do better. And I I think overall, what what I what struck me most about thinking of how fast the vaccines have gone, and versus how 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 not fast the drugs have gone, or the conversation about can a vaccine be done versus can a drug be be done? If you listen to the people in the vaccine world, they say, look, hang on, end of January, we knew we can get a thing that will be a vaccine candidate. We know exactly what to do. We take this gene, we clone it, we put it in this package, don't know, manufacture it, and by the end, by say August, we will put it into patients. So the process was very well mapped out and everybody believed it was possible. They said, okay, here's the money, go. In drug discovery, the process is not understood to be well-defined. It is seen to be a meandering process and you muck around and get here and there. Nevertheless, it can be well-defined. So I think maybe this is the thing we in the small molecule drug discovery field as a whole have to get better at to say, this is the process, it stands, give us the gene, we will do X, Y, Z, and in the end we'll have small molecule candidates that can go. It will take this long and we optimize that process. I think it's a doable thing, um, but we'll have to work a bit harder. The vaccine guys seem to have cracked it in, in, in certain ways, even though the biological risk around the vaccine is as big as, a, as that for a drug. So the clinical, a lot of things go wrong. You're targeting a human organism and hoping it's safe and all these other things. It's a bet worth taking, but the interesting thing is the process that's well-defined. We don't have that in small molecule discovery, and we can. I think this is, for me, the biggest takeaway. We can just line up the ducks, and when the pandemic comes, shoot them. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think I think that actually is uh, is a is a great discussion point of like you know there it, it's not just that uh, that the that the governments may not you know they there may be funding there, but these are just hard problems, and and it's not easy to to suddenly just up and solve these things. And, and there's a lot of unknown unknowns. Uh, to when there's it... a surprising lack of funding for fixing those problems though. Yeah. Like there, there, are, there are organizations trying to accelerate drug discovery, but they do it by doing more of what's traditionally done uh, rather than focusing on solving the problems that are limiting the efficiency of drug discovery right now. Um, it's surprising how little funding there is for, for refining those processes and configuring things, and uh, like Frank suggests, to be uh, poised to take advantage of new opportunities that come by. I should say that you know, if we look at just you know the, the, the sort of founders of the moonshot, we too were optimizing our little thing. I mean, I was thinking of experimental fragment discovery. I knew there was this problem of taking it forward, but I hadn't really got my act together to talk to people that might do it. And I think you know, all of us have our speciality. What does it take to bring together these potential you know, solutions to part of the problem and put them as a whole? And it's interesting to, to see how, you know, I had been talking to John before and also Alpha briefly, and but we hadn't sort of teamed up and said, we'll do it now. So was it funding? Was it time? You know, it's hard to know. And, and the urgency of a pandemic is um, like, like war, does remarkable things, which is, it's a shame that we need these urgencies to to get together. But I think there are clear technological lessons to be learned. Um, and, and this is only, you know, now I'm looking, as you start observing all the experiments you have to do downstream for these in vivo and preclinical tests. And again, you see huge technological inefficiencies which are baked into it. I mean, it's just really hard to think how you might do it in general, but I'm sure there's a huge efficiency to be gained over the next decade of, of developments. So. And I think a big issue with uh, a lot of existing approaches, particularly in industry, but also in academia is, you know, a lot of the results, A, uh, cannot be published because of IP or will not be published because once the campaign is over, you only 
you know, um, tell a narrative um, which, which, you know, fits a hy hypothesis. But the nice about Moonshot is that that, 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 um, oh, that, that, that luxury is not available to us. We publish everything and we don't have any IP concerns. And so we're not afraid of um, telling you you're exactly where we are. And I think, I mean, the field, there's a lot to be gained by this open dissemination of knowledge. And for example, if you go to a conference talk in, 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 a, in a typical conference, a, a pharmaceutical company can present in broad terms, challenges and opportunities, but definitely not go into details like talking about life series structures of the compounds and exactly what's the next strategy for a life target that they, they would get fired immediately. But I think the luxury here is that we are allowed to disclose everything. And, and I think getting feedback from the community, also support from industry as well, telling us, yeah. sharing ultimately knowledge and insights they have get. And I think Moonshot, if you may, is an, almost like an open kitchen for, for, for a biotech. And I think that might nucleate a new type of biotechs that are a lot more agile, data-driven, mm -hmm. and driven by frontiers of science. I mean, there's yeah. part of that that you can go to GitHub and pull it down. <laughs> you know, it's like, exactly. it's, it's shocking. You know, it's, it's all there. Now, of course, the data on its own doesn't do the job. And ideally, we would have had videos running of our discussions and people can look <laughs> at it and learn. Because the other thing that, I mean, you've, if you haven't heard medicinal chemists and in vivo people talk, you will not know the problems coming away. I think there's a lot of training that could be going through initiatives like this. Um, but yeah, just the data being mineable, I, I don't think people have really cottoned onto yet to this pile of resource that just, that's emerged. And I have to pinch myself to think, wow, you know, this has emerged. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of like, you know, the, the wealth of data now that's out there, thanks to things like GitHub and our AWS open data set sources. Um, someone else in our chat asked, are there ways for people who are perhaps non-traditionally, quote unquote, in drug research or academic fields to engage and help out in you know, time donations or connections uh, or just spare time that can be donated? How can, how can people help engage further? Well, you know, we're always, uh, go ahead, Alpha. Well, I think um, as, as a project, if, I mean, if you are scientifically trained and obviously um, the data is there for you to mine and help us analyze data and provide us comments if you're MedChem training. But I think even as a citizen scientist, I think a very powerful uh, voice is actually uh, on, a, on a more advocacy level, uh, raising awareness of the importance of fundamental science in, in public policy, almost reaching, I mean, not to make a fine point out of it, but reaching to your representative where, wherever you live that, you know, science is actually important and you should fund it. I think um, that may be um, obvious to us in, in this call, but it may not obvious to every uh, political leader out there. And I think, you know, as a, as a, as a citizen, like you in some way have a lot of voice in shaping the narrative and discussion about science and how we should move forward. Should we forget about COVID after the economy reopens? Hell no. And I think, if you write to your representatives that we should not forget about COVID after the whole thing blows over and you should continue funding COVID research where whichever country you live in, I think that would really help the field. I think looking back at the literature, um, we found a lot of compounds from 15 years ago, which if we were to develop it 15 years ago, there would be no COVID-19. There would be no lives uh, being, be, be being killed if those compounds were developed. Why they're not developed? It's not the science, it's money, it is the lack of incentives um, from almost the political arena to develop that. So I think as a citizen scientist and citizen, there's a lot that you can do to help this. I, I, I think, um, yeah, so this project as such, um, it, it's, you know, what can you do as a citizen scientist? Um, it's very technical at this point, right? You know, we've got specific things like there's a metabolic risk around this group and, you know, we are very lucky to tap into deep experience. So it's not that clear what to do that apart from contribute to GPU, but the landscape in which this exists needs a lot of curating. <laughs> and look at the, the this example. I mean, the Wellcome Trust themselves were putting out the briefing about a month and a half ago to just point the disparity of funding for new vaccines versus new new drugs. And so, for instance, um, are people just going to sit back and say, "Oh, great, the vaccines coming, so let's just chill out," or will they say, "Hang on"? our you know our um, uh, populations or we're not aware enough yet of what are the mitigation strategies that would be needed and we're not going to stop with COVID because there's tb there's malaria there's, you know tb is still the biggest killer you know these things are 
massively underfunded. And they all have, I think this is a, an interesting question. It's a very much a political one. Um, the current understanding, which is completely widespread, is that to get funding to get the compound to clinic, we'll need some kind of in, uh, uh, return on investment based funding. It is a completely established paradigm. You will never get the millions needed if the investors do not get a return. But the problem is that for the big diseases, there is no market. There literally is no market. There will not be a, a source of revenue for antibiotic resistance, for TB, even COVID. You know, okay, there's obviously the, the uh, first world, the, you know, the developed economies, but then there's the undeveloped economies. The market will not exist. Um, so how do you address those? And how can we shift the conversation for some fraction of the GDP to go into these miracle solutions <laughs> that when they emerge are miracles, but they will not emerge unless we somehow generate the collective um, uh, spirit to fund them. I think that kind of advocacy, that conversation is really worth getting out there and, and having as a very active conversation at the political level. And so I don't know if that helps the, the, the questioner because it's a very diffuse answer. <laughs> it's a very big problem. But I think ultimately the scientists can only do the technical one and the, the drive will have to come from the broader population. I think I think it's a great answer though. It's a you know, it's a it's a hard problem. I think is the is the hard is the hardest uh, and it's a, it's one that doesn't have a clear answer. It's a very nebulous nebulous answer that can be solved in a lot of ways. Um, I think we only have one more question left actually. And and John, maybe you have the best uh, best know how to answer this question. But uh, with quantum computing on the rise, uh, you know what implications does that have for for being able to to run? Uh, simulations. That's a great question. And I, I can assure you that Folding at Home will support your quantum coprocessors once you install them. Um, but it might be a little while, right? Realistically, uh, it might be some time before we have enough coherent qubits to be able to do really productive, uh, extremely useful computations. The, the nearest term for biomolecular modeling and simulation is that uh, if you had enough qubits, you could run uh, quantum chemistry algorithms that give you what's called coupled cluster accuracy uh, to, um, uh, with uh, very fast uh, performance. Um, and it, you know it, these coupled cluster calculations require you do a huge number of calculations if you have to do them classically, but they give you very accurate representations of the interactions of small molecules with proteins if you could do them at big enough scale. Um, it's it's just going to be a while though. It's, we don't quite know how how long it will be, but um, my guess is it will be sometime after your quantum computer is being powered by your fusion reactor. <laughs> uh yeah, I think that's that's all the questions we have and, and all the time we have. So uh, so thank you so much, John, Alpha, and Frank. This is super exciting. Super excited to see where the the COVID moonshot goes. Feel free to follow them. They're on Twitter at COVID underscore moonshot and postera.ai slash COVID. Uh, so please please check them out. Uh, and uh, we're just gonna cut away briefly to, uh, to a video segment before we uh, talk about a giveaway we're doing. Before you do though, uh, Sukrit, I just want to give a shout out to all of the fantastic students and postdocs that are the lifeblood of Folding at Home and always have been, uh, and the programmers um, as well. Uh, you, you folks are what's responsible for making uh, Folding at Home great, along with the community members that have donated their time to help us out, uh, community managers, and all of the volunteers. Um, you know, we couldn't do it without all of you folks. Uh, but it's a huge team worldwide effort. You can help fight COVID-19. The pandemic felt so overwhelming. Staying at home wasn't enough. The novel coronavirus has humbled every nation and every individual. But it doesn't have to be like that. Maybe if you could, you know, gather all the computers in the world and, and put them to work. And to be able to do things that you could not do by any other means. With your help, we can. The Folding at Home project does exactly that. Folding at Home is using its distributed computing model to create the most powerful supercomputer on Earth. The collective power of millions of volunteers to aid COVID-19 research efforts. In a grassroots example. Your rig is helping researchers find treatments and vaccines faster. We're passionate about this effort and the impact it is having. We need people like you. Working together can make such a big difference. You can learn more at foldingathome.org.
So thanks, thanks everyone again for, for joining us and uh, everyone who's helped with holding at home over the past 20 years, whether the research team or volunteering computing or you know, participating in one of the companies, you know, through one of the companies that supported us. It's you know, really been amazing to watch all of the progress from uh, you know, uh, focusing on very basic research problems that underpin a lot of medical applications to all the way to uh, hunting for, for drugs and trying to move them into animal models and uh, clinical trials eventually. So uh, it's been great to see what's happened so far and I, I look forward to you know, many years of, of making further progress and you know, about a thousand fold growth in our compute power and the uh, great swaths of biology that that will open up to us. Uh, so, so thanks again.